Coming up, a Cherokee singer is teaching and making music with his traditional language, and the Bureau of Indian Affairs is turning 200 this year. Plus, we bring you part two of our conversation with Hawaiian singer Kamale Kava'a competing on NBC's The Voice. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines on the ICT newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT newscast with Aliyah Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Hopa. Thank you for joining us. I am Aliyah Chavez. We start today in North Dakota, where a new tax will soon be imposed on alcoholic beverages that are sold on the lands of a tribal nation. The Mandan, Hidatsa, and Arikara Nation will share the revenue from the tax under an agreement signed by the state's governor and the nation in a first-of-its-kind deal. The MHA Nation is set to keep 80 percent of the tax revenue, with tribal chairman Mark Fox praising the move for enabling his nation to bring in additional revenue. Last year, a bill was signed to allow the state to enter into revenue sharing agreements with tribal nations to prevent double taxation. We move now north of the medicine line, where after almost two years of protests, the Canadian government will fund the search of a landfill for the remains of two Indigenous women. $20 million from the country and the provincial Manitoba government will search the Prairie Green landfill in Winnipeg. In 2022, police rejected searching due to toxic materials and the unsafe environment of the landfill, despite community outcry to find the remains of the slain women. According to Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe in a statement, the funds will search every cubic meter of relevant space in order to recover their bodies. Well, last weekend, Muscogee Creek Nation citizens traveled to Alabama for the 210th anniversary of the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. In 1814, 800 Muscogee warriors, women, and children died while defending their lands from U.S. forces. The battle was the single bloodliest day for of conflict for Native Americans with U.S. troops. It paved the way for white settler expansion in the southeast and the eventual forced removal from the region. Muscogee citizens and leaders commemorated their ancestors at a ceremony honoring and remembering them. It was just, you know, it was basically outnumbered, but they was going to fight to the end and do what they can to, the war is going to do what they can to protect them. The, the women and children protect ourselves, protect our freedom, what we had here. And just basically just telling the true history of what it was. There's power in a name, especially when spoken in your native tongue. At Red Cloud School, they're embracing the power to promote healing while honoring their community's heritage. Head coach Matt Rama tells us the importance of a name in this story brought to us by our partners at South Dakota Public Broadcasting, produced by Jackson Thorson. <laughs> Yeah, at uh, Makapia Luto, Iowa, formerly known as Red Cloud School, we have officially changed our name to use the Lakota word for a Red Cloud School, so it's Makapia Luto, Iowa. Red Cloud School, Makapia Luto, has been going through a truth and healing um, initiative, just really taking a look at our past as a boarding school um, and where we want to go in the future with the Lakota students. We felt one important thing was to really acknowledge the heritage and the language and to continue to use, um, I mean, the chief's name is Red Cloud in English, but his name is Mach Pialuta, that's his name. And so if we're gonna honor him, we should honor him by his name and not um, a translation of his name. This week on Indigenous Politics, we learn more about the Bureau of Indian Affairs. On March 11th, the BIA reached its 200th year. Here with that conversation is ICT political correspondent Polly Dinetclaw and regular contributor John Tasuda, who is a principal at Navigators Global. Welcome back to the newscast, John. Thanks for having me again. 
So earlier this month in March, the Bureau of Indian Affairs turned 200 years old. Can you talk a little bit about the history of the Bureau? Um, yes, it's one of the most unique federal agencies, actually, uh, not just because it deals with Indian tribes, um, but uh, its own history is very unique. Most folks don't know, but the agency originally started out as a department, as part of the Department of War, which is the predecessor to the now Department of Defense. Um, and uh, when this was established in 1824, there weren't actually a lot of federal agencies. Um, so uh, there was no place else to put it. And at the time, the major interactions between tribes and the United States was through the Department of War, not always because of conflict, but because um, the D Department of War was responsible for fulfilling the requirements that the United States had uh, in most of the treaties at the time, which, prevent, pro which prohibited most non-Indian people from entering into uh, Indian country or the Indian territory at the time. So the Department of War was responsible for those interactions. Uh, they licensed people. They needed an agency to take care of those sort of administrative tasks. So they set up uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And John, can you tell us a little bit about the purpose of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and what it is tasked with in the Department of the Interior? Certainly. Um, so again, a uh, very unique history. <clears throat> The um, department, or sorry, the agency really started out in assisting the Department of War, and then in 1849, when the Department of Interior was created, it moved from this uh, uh, agency within the Department of War into the civilian, the new civilian agency, the Department of Interior. But its its tasks didn't really change at that point. Uh, primarily, they engaged in sort of the day to day activities that the United States needed with the tribes, particularly those in which it had treaty relationships. And at the time, that included things like delivering treaty rations, et cetera. Um, sometimes the United States was supposed to deliver like farm equipment. Um, and then it also oversaw the beginnings of things like uh, education for Indian children by uh, bringing in usually um, church missionary groups to to start uh, education schools, et cetera, for, uh, for Indian children. And so that was sort of where it began. Uh, but of course, as we know, over time, it has morphed into this agency that provides a lot of sort of on the ground, if you might, want, might think of them as municipal government services. And that really occurred in sort of the late, what we call the late reservation period, late in the 1800s, um, you know, right before the turn of the 20th century and right before allotment, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs sort of mushroomed into this agency because the United States was on a path to try to civilize Indians and get them used to what people thought of as sort of regular civilized life, you, you know, living in communities, having municipal services, the things that most Americans were, were really starting to get used to at the time. And so the BIA filled in that filled in that role on most reservations. And again, that led to this mushrooming of this of this agency in, in its administrative tasks. So they provided not just big things like schools and even hospitals at the time, but everything down to um, setting up bank accounts at local banks outside of the reservation for Indian people to use, et cetera. And really um, it's sort of informal goal was to educate Indians on how to be civilized. And so it, it took on all these tasks. And as we're looking ahead to the next 100 years of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, what should be the focus or what should be the direction, the needle that the Bureau should head towards? Um, that's a really great question. Um, and part of that depends on the vision that tribal leadership have. Um, you know, we've been on this path now for for several decades of what we call self-governance, self-determination. And in, and in that role, which a number of tribes have uh, sort of tried to exercise as much as they can uh, to, the, to the max, the BIA has really sort of a background role. The tribes provide all the things that the, that the Bureau of Indian Affairs used to provide. And really the, the BIA is sort of, um, in some ways, a funding funnel uh, to them. Uh, while it does still retain that trust responsibility to make sure that the services that it's funding through the tribe are actually provided, but it really sort of serves in this background role. 
However, there are other tribes that feel like the United States needs to continue to uh, fulfill its treaty responsibilities directly. And we call those direct service tribes. And so the BIA has this direct responsibility to provide the kinds of services that other tribes do for themselves. So child care services, all these things that that uh, other tribes provide, um, they they uh, they do it as well. Um, and so that's actually something I think that um, Indian country leadership uh, should think about seriously for the next 100 years. You know, is one vision better than the other? Do we still need to have both? And and where that line sort of falls in between those two. And and these days, as we know, the original responsibilities uh, that the BI had, which spread all you know sort of a, the full spectrum of government services, are now um, have been divvied up. And some are at uh, the Indian Health Service, which is within HHS. Uh, some are at the Department of Education, um, and some are at, the, at HUD uh, for Housing and Urban Development. And so um, those agencies as well often have similar programs like self-governance and and the same question really needs to be asked by tribal leadership. You know, what what uh, model do we want to follow? The self-governance model or we want the United States to still remain providing these direct services? So that's a big question. And what are some of the ways that in, you know, the immediate five, 10 years that the the Bureau could do to improve the services that it does provide. You know, I've heard a lot of talk from tribal leaders about the grant process. And so I'm curious what you've also heard as well. So I think that uh, there is uh, improvements that can be made in the grant process. Um, I think they've come a long ways and they've tried to standardize it. It used to be that there were substantial differences between the way funding for self-determination or self-governance contracts came through versus those for the direct service tribes and, and uh, tribes that got grants uh, that ran alongside direct services. Um, that's been standardized to, um, to a large degree, but there's still improvements that can be made there. Um, the biggest thing probably for tribes is the timing of funding. Uh, sometimes the federal government's timing of funding does not match up with the tribe's uh, needs and how their budget cycles run or how they run their programs. And so uh, that's always a place for improvement, I think. Um, but I, I would say I would give a plug. One thing that is critically important to the future of the BIA and, and how the United States is going to meet its trust responsibilities to tribes is the BIA workforce. Um, you know, the success of self-governance over decades has pulled a lot of the the professional workforce out of the BIA and into tribal employment, um, which which is great and was intended, but at the same time, it's left the BIA uh, much depleted with experienced and, and professional uh, uh, folks to, to deliver those services. And so um, it really is struggling and has been for a long time with a, developing a workforce to continue to provide the direct services that it needs, as well as the, the professional services needed for grant programs, self-determination programs. And so that's uh, that's really a great need. It's something that the Bureau needs to uh, really take leadership of itself, but the tribe should really think about how they can encourage that as well, because it benefits not just the BIA, but it benefits the tribes, particularly if we can continue to have a very vibrant uh, native workforce in the BIA. That's part of what has made the change over in the BIA in the last few decades so successful is the, is the big expansion of the native pop, uh, uh, employment population within the BIA um, employment. Well, John, that's all the time that we have. Thank you once again for joining the newscast and sharing Thank with you. us a little bit about the BIA. Thank you. Always enjoy it. On Monday, we brought you a conversation with the Hawaiian singer Kamale Kava'a, who has wowed the judges on NBC's The Voice. In the second part of our interview, we spoke about language, family, hula, and community. You speak the Hawaiian language fluently, and we've heard you speak a little bit in the episode so far. Why is that important to you? It's, it's important to me to perpetuate Hawaiian language um, because in, in all native people's, you know, sense in a, in a native sense or in, in a, in an indigenous sense, language is, is, is the beginning of it all, you know, without our language, we wouldn't be a people, you know, and I think that the language is, is the most important thing, you know, it's the way that we communicate with each other. It's the oldest way, you know, of us to feel our ancestors, to feel our kupuna is, is through speaking the same, same language and the same words that they uttered too. So 
you know, Merry Monarch is coming up very soon. Tell our viewers about the festival. Yeah, so the Merry Monarch Festival is a, is a hula competition that features um, the best hula schools and, and hula um, people from all around the world um, and, and throughout Hawaii. And besides the competition part, it's, it's a way for us to put hula, which is the way that we tell stories in, in Hawaii, uh, the way that, that our, our stories, our place names, a lot of things are passed down through these chants and through these dances. Um, it's it's a way for us to put that and and magnify it on this this huge stage and and what we call it is we call it the Olympics of hula, and it's it's where the best of the best come we compete but even even more so than competing it's a way for us to to continue to make sure that that art of of dancing that art of chanting and, and telling stories lives on uh, through the test of time. In your blind audition on The Voice, we saw short snippets of your mom and your wife. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. So uh, growing up, I, I, I say it all the time. I say that I was born into hula. And, and it, it's something that came automatic to me. And because my mom is a kumuhula, she's a, a master hula teacher. Um, my siblings and I grew up um, in and around hula our whole lives. You know, I really started dancing at the age of eight with the hula school that I'm with now, but growing up, it was, it was an automatic, you know, and I'm really glad that, that I was, I was born in the setting that I was born in because it pushed me to really be a part of my culture, you know, and in Hawaii, you'd think that a lot of people have that, that access to culture and that access to cultural things, but, but we really don't here. It's, it's, it's actually pretty hard to come across people who speak Hawaiian, who dance hula, who practice their culture. Um, but I was one of the lucky ones who was born into it. And um, I don't take that for granted. Um, and I make sure that that it's a point that I have a daughter now, you know, that, that she is also surrounded by that, that hopefully one day she'll fall in love with it the same way that we did, you know. That is really beautiful. In the show, you've highlighted how proud you are to come from the island of Maui, which of course has been in the news because of the deadly wildfires. What is something that you really wish was highlighted about the recovery efforts? I think one of the things that needs to be highlighted other than all of the hurt, right? And all of the, the trauma and all of the, the, the anguish, right? That has happened um, through all of that. One of the greatest things that I've seen through our community and, and throughout Hawaii is number one, love, hope, you know, and community, you know, those three things were, were, were three positive things that came out of such a, a crazy disaster, you know, but through that, our people were able to, to show those three things, you know, love to each other, you know, hope that that we're going to get through this and recover and community, the whole community coming together, pretty much shutting down our whole island for the time being, you know, um, and putting their full support and supporting everyone who, who was affected by that fires. Well, Kamale, the best of luck to you. And thank you so much for joining us on the ICT Newscast. Thank you so much, Mahalo. Thank you for having me. You can catch the first part of my conversation with Kamale at ictnews.org under the tab Newscasts. Up, Judge. Up, Judge. I'll see you again. Upch means again. Upjuj is I'll see you again because there is no such thing as goodbye in the Passamaquoddy language.
That was a Gully Sig Chuge Mackey, a Cherokee music artist and language educator. He spoke with ICT's Paris Wise about the Cherokee Nation's immersion school and what language has meant in his life, even sharing a few lessons of his own. I guess our specialty is language immersion um, in Cherokee language. So we only speak Cherokee in the school. Um, and we don't do any like English literature or anything uh, with English literacy. It's all in Cherokee. And my job here at the school is a cultural advisor or instructor. Um, I'm a co-teacher um, with a woman named Rachel Bearpaw or Anawig. It is our job to take all the grades and teach them about our history and our culture and our beliefs. Um, as Cherokee people. And Cherokee would just call it Jalik Jun Deskwarsti. Just means Cherokee. It means where they learn Cherokee, pretty much. Were you once a student yourself? Yes, I was. So um, the immersion school goes from three year olds to around 14. Um, so pre, what would that be? Preschool to eighth grade. And then they start uh, at the high school just down the road here. Um, and yeah, I used to be a student here. Um, I started whenever I turned three and I went all the way through. It took me a couple different tries in some years, uh, but I got her done. And so, yeah, I used to go here and a lot has changed, um, since my time here and, um, what I do now and my experience with it now, I've kind of switched roles, I guess. What is some of the curriculum or the kinds of lessons that go on? Me personally, my favorite uh, forms of curriculum is kind of just being a doer, um, not learning from a book, not learning off a board, actually going out and doing the thing that you're trying to talk about in the language. We go out and cook for big events and we'll try to prepare words beforehand. Um, I don't think it's really useful. I think just trying to use the words that you already know, asking the people around you as you're doing it for those words that you don't know, um, that's how you learn the language. Um, not necessarily trying to map it out off a board and trying to remember this and that and that, just trying to use it and being wrong. Got to be fine with being wrong, <laughs> I guess. I know you have prepared some phrases um, for our audience in Cherokee. It's kind of a long word, and a lot of the words in our language can be pretty long, but um, in the grand scheme of things, one word uh, can make an entire English sentence. So um, pretty much means in an English way um, to love each other and to be stingy with each other's well-being and making sure that everyone is accounted for and taken care of. Gota, it means fire. And gota is usually, um, it usually only refers to the whole fire. So in Cherokee, we were very specific with how we talk about things. And um, so we have, you know, different words for flames, different words for coals, um, you know, and it's just the same way in every language, but for gota, it means fire as a whole. For Cherokees, the significance to fire is it's one thing that we use to pray with um, as a group, not just, um, not just as something that I would do in my free time, but we all come together and dance around a fire. Um, and we say that that fire sends our prayers to Unesana, or which is our word for God. Um, and so Gota is one of the things that I think of whenever I think of um, being tricky and doing tricky things. That's fire. What kind of impact has language had in your life? I know you're also a musician. It sounds kind of silly, but I've always grown up, you know, doing some form of language learning or speaking or involvement in the culture. And I've always been grateful for that. Um, and I try to just live my life 
with the language, trying to use the language at home with my son and my wife. Um, I try talking to my family in the language, the ones that know it, and try to teach the ones that don't know it what they want to know. Um, and it has definitely um, started me on a path to be a Cherokee musician with contemporary music. I started playing the guitar over the pandemic and uh, then I started writing songs in the language and um, a lot of folks locally like that and even not locally, you know, people all around enjoy it. But um, it has given me, um, I almost can't imagine my life without it, you know. It's, uh, I don't think I've ever had to not have it. Um, I've always been able to have my language and culture whenever I whenever I need it. I don't think I've ever escaped <laughs> yet. Bye. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me, absolutely. That is a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit us at ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.